Hello and welcome to another video here at the N10 Hockey Channel. Today we've got a few things to discuss, including a major extension signing in Dallas, some more injury updates, there have been some both good and bad news on the injury front over the past few days, and then some trade rumors involving the Canucks and the Montreal Canadiens. We'll get to all of that coming up right now. Hello and welcome to another video here at the N10 Hockey Channel. Today I'll kick things off with a major extension signing with the Dallas Stars as Dallas has signed top-line center Rupe Hintz to an eight-year extension that will have an average annual value of $8.45 million, and the deal will start at the beginning of next year. So Hintz has done a, quite an amazing job with the Dallas Stars as their top-line center. He took a few years to get into the role, but he's done quite well over the past three years. Starting in the shortened season, he put up 43 points in 41 games in the shortened season and did absolutely amazing and then last year he did a lot better he got into a, around 80 games he played almost the full season and he got 37 goals and 72 points last year and he was a monster for the stars offensively and this year he, it's no different he has 11 goals and 30 points in 24 games which is absolutely astounding Great stuff so far by Rupa Hintz this year, including in his most recent game, getting a hat-trick against the Wild on Sunday. So Hintz is looking like a great top-line center. I think signing him to this deal is great. I think this is a really good extension by the Dallas Stars. 8.45, I think maybe a little bit too much in the future. I think Hintz is absolutely worth 8.5 right now. But when it gets later on to the contract, I think it could start to look a bit bad. But for now, it looks pretty good. Hintz is playing top center minutes on a line with Robertson and Pavelski, and that line has done amazingly for the Dallas Stars. So I expect that line to continue to produce and do well. Pavelski and Robertson are also producing at high levels, and that trio is one of the best lines in hockey, I would say. So getting Hintz extended is good. They already got Robertson extended, and now they have Hintz extended. They also have goalie Andres extended, so all their younger players are now locked up for the next two to three years, and this Dallas Stars team looks dangerous, I will say. Dallas is currently leading the Central Division, and Hintz and Robertson and Pavelski have been a huge part of that, so hopefully Hintz can continue to produce well, continue to put up points. I mean, he's putting up a lot of points right now. I could probably see him hit 30 goals again this year, so great signing by Dallas Stars to get him locked up. Hintz has really come into his own over the past three years, putting up really good point totals and I expect Hintz to continue to the same and he's on pace right now for probably around 85-90 points so getting him all locked up right now for just under 8.5 million is a really good deal and I think in a year or two when Hintz is reaching the peak of his career this is going to look like an absolute steal so great job for the Dallas Stars to sign Rupe Hintz and hopefully with Robertson and Pavelski on his wings that trio can continue to produce and be a driving force for the Stars offense. Now that's all the signings we want to get to. Let's go over to the injury updates as we have had some more injury updates. I'll start off in Columbus. The news has really been very, very bad for majority of the season this year. I mean, they've had so many injuries and it's really played a huge role in why the Blue Jackets are currently dead last in the Eastern Conference with 18 points. But they did get some more healthy bodies back finally. They were able to activate top six winger Patrick Laine and goaltender Ellis Rimmers-Leakins off of IR late last week and have gone into a couple games of NHL action since then. Rimmers-Leakins is a good starting goaltender. He's had a rough start this year, but then again, this Jackets team is first not really good defensively and second dealing with a ton of defensive injuries. So it makes sense why his numbers are not too good. But on the flip side, Merzlikens looks to be a good starting goaltender, and if between now and maybe next offseason, they can find a way to rework that defense, get some he more healthy bodies in there, maybe rework it so they're a little bit more defensive, I think Merzlikens could still be a really good starting goaltender. But getting back in there to help this Jackets team at least get out of the basement of the league is a good start. Merzlikens has not played to his potential up this year, but he has been a good goaltender, so getting him back is huge. I know. Tarasov could probably use some more AHL time in the minors, and Corpus Allo is still not the starter he was a few years ago. So getting Merzlikens back is pretty big for the Blue Jackets, and the goaltending core is probably their healthiest position right now. So Merzlikens should be able to go right back in and get play starting role minutes and hopefully get the Jackets a couple of wins and some key saves when they need it. 
As for Lion A, he was able to jump right back into a top six role. He's been in and out of the lineup due to injuries, and it's really been hard for him to work any chemistry with Johnny Goudreau, which is what the Jackets were hoping when they signed Goudreau in the offseason. They were hoping Goudreau and Lion A could mesh, and they could be a really lethal tandem on the top line for this Jackets team. And Line A's injuries just kept him out so much that they haven't really gotten any chemistry. But over these past few games, it does seem like Line A and Goudreau are starting to play a little bit better together. I know Line A has had a couple of goals since then, and Goudreau's had a few assists. So it's good to see those two doing good. I know Goudreau's done quite well the start of this year in Columbus. And hopefully Line A, if he can stay healthy, can continue to be a good point-producing goal-scoring forward for the Jackets. So it's not the best. They still have, I think, like six or seven players on injury reserve right now. But getting Merzlikens back in goal and getting another top six forward back in line A is huge for this Jackets team. And at least getting a few more healthy bodies is going to help this team at least a little bit. And given the fact that Merzlikens and line A are some of the more important bodies on the Jackets team, it makes them that much bigger. Over in Tampa Bay, they had both good and bad news. Now, we've already talked about Balsers and how he was placed on injury reserve. Well, he has now been moved to long-term injury reserve and will miss probably the next two, three weeks at the very least due to injury. Now, Balsers was claimed off of waivers from the Florida Panthers, and I don't think that him being placed on injury reserve is too big for the Tampa Bay Lightning. Now, he was acquired off of waivers, but he didn't really get into much game action before his injury with Tampa Bay. I mean, I think he only got into like two or three games with the Lightning, so he's been more of a depth forward, so... Losing him to long-term injury reserve is not ideal. It does weaken their depth a little bit, and it does give them one less healthy body on the forward group, but it's not the biggest of losses, so I think the Bolts will be able to cope with the loss of Balsers for the next two or three weeks, but hopefully he can recover soon and get back to being a good bottom six forward for the Lightning. But they had to move him on long-term injury reserve to activate top six center Anthony Sorelli. Now, Sorelli had off-season surgery, and missed the entirety of the season up to this point due to an injury. So getting Sorelli back is huge for this Lightning team. Sorelli is easily one of their best offensive contributors. He's a good two-way center for the Lightning. He's done a great job over the past few years in establishing himself as a top six center for the Lightning. And I think that he's probably going to need a few games to get back up to speed. I mean, he's missed two and a half months of the season, so he's going to be a little bit slow to start the year. But... Hopefully he can just get back into the rhythm and hopefully continue to be a good top six center. I know it'll probably take a little bit of time for him to get back to his post-injury uh, self, but hopefully it shouldn't take too long. And given the fact that the Bolts have had some problems with some secondary scoring this year, getting Sorelli back is going to be huge. I think Sorelli is a huge piece of this Lightning team, especially when they lost guys in the offseason like Platt and McDonough and some of those other depth guys. Getting a guy like Sorelli back could be substantially huge for the Tampa Bay Lightning. And I think that if they can continue to get Sorelli into some games, he can continue to be that good two-way force that the Lightning love. And hopefully he can continue to help with the secondary scoring on that Bolts team. So now over to the Avalanche, where they have had pretty rough news on the injury front. Now, just looking at their injuries, they have now... Arturi Lackanen out, who's injured. He was an unhealthy scratch. He hasn't been placed on IR yet. So I'm not exactly sure how long he's going to be out, but Lackanen is right now out. McKinnon left last night's game against the Philadelphia Flyers due to an injury. So this team is really banged up right now. You can see in their record, they're not playing to the level of the team who won the Western Conference last year and won the Stanley Cup. But they're still hanging into a playoff spot, but hopefully they can get a little bit healthier. And this week has not been good for them, as they did lose Lekkinen and they've lost McKinnon. But it seems to be maybe could be a bad injury for McKinnon. But on top of that, they did place Bowen Byram and Josh Manson on injury reserve over the past week. Now, Manson was a really bad blow to this team. They'd already lost Byram for a few games. They had lost Gerard. So losing Manson is horrible. That's like three of your top five defensemen. Literally, you have basically Taves and McCarr, who is your top pair, and Eric Johnson, who is another regular, healthy. And then you have more depth pieces on that Avalanche's roster. So their decor is really banged up right now. Losing Manson is awful. I hope that he can get back soon. I don't think it'll be too long, probably 
two weeks, maybe around there until he gets back. But placing Manson on injury reserve when they already have guys like Gerard and Byram out, not ideal. And then to make a roster spot, they have to place Byram on injury reserve in the last few days. Now, I don't think this comes as much surprise. Byram's already missed, like, I think two, maybe three weeks with an injury. So he being placed on injury reserve is not too substantial. He can come back whenever he's healthy. So that's not too surprising that they just placed him on injury reserve to open up a roster spot so they can have that 23-man roster to play. But just with Byron missing the last few weeks, it's been awful. Byron missed some time last year due to an injury. So Byron's young career has already been riddled with injuries. So hopefully he can come back in the near future and continue to be a good point-producing defenseman for the Avalanche. I don't think he should be out too much longer. I mean, he's already missed a few weeks. I'll probably say maybe another few weeks until he's back. Hopefully the Avs can continue to win some games as with top six centers like Lekkanen, McKinnon, and Landis Cog out right now and top four defensemen like Manson and Gerard and even Byram. This team is really hurting bad and they're starting to get a lot of injuries and hopefully some of these guys can come back soon because this Avalanche team really needs some of these star players to get back in the lineup so they can get on a run and start winning some games and catch some of those teams in the Central. Over in Carolina, there's only one injury news that I want to talk about, and that is that the Hurricanes have activated Tivu Teravainen off of injury reserve, and he has been able to get back into game action over the weekend. So Teravainen is a good top six winger for the Carolina Hurricanes, the Carolina Hurricanes have some decent depth this year, so they were able to win a lot of the games in which Teravine missed time due to injury. But getting Teravine back is huge. He's a key top six winger on this Carolina Hurricanes team. He is one of the more veterany players in that top six, with guys like younger guys like Jarvis, Nacious, and Kakaniemi also there. So getting him back is huge. He can put up points. He's done pretty well up to this point this year before his injury. So either playing on the second line with Sveshnikov or the top line with Ajo, but giving the Canes not only another healthy body, but a healthy top six body who can score, is just going to make them that much more lethal. They looked lethal without guys like Tara Vinen and Frederick Anderson, the goalie, in net over the past few weeks. Getting Tara Vinen back is huge, and it'll just make them that much more lethal. So the addition of Tara Vinen is going to be big for the Hurricanes, and he's going to give them another element to the offense that's been missing over the past few weeks. Over in New York... The Islanders have now officially placed Kyle Palmieri on injury reserve as he has been missing some time due to injury. Now, Palmieri had been missing a week, probably two weeks due to an injury, and he had been an unhealthy scratch, but with some other injuries possibly going on, they wanted to call up some other players just in case they needed to play some more, so they placed Palmieri on injury reserve. And it's not been good for Palmieri. He's been missing the past few weeks due to injury. So it's not really ideal. The majority of the season he's been playing on the third line for the Islanders, being more of a depth forward. So it's not too ideal to have him in that situation. But getting some playing time for younger guys like Simone Holmstrom and Wallstrom and Bouvillier, and those guys have been producing well. So I think Palmieri on the third line is probably the best option right now with those younger guys continuing to produce. But still, losing a good middle six forward like Palmieri is not an ideal situation for the Islanders. They've been definitely doing a lot of good offensive things over the past few weeks and months. And it looked like a better offensive team this year than they were last few seasons. But still, losing an offensive weapon like Palmieri is not going to be good for the Islanders. And while I think that they do have the depth that they need to overcome this sort of an injury, it's still going to be hard to make do without Palmieri for the foreseeable future. And hopefully Palmieri can get back into game action in the very near future. Over in Chicago, as they have to play bottom pairing defenseman, Jared Tenorti on injury reserve, and he's going to miss the foreseeable future due to an injury. Now, Tenorti is not the biggest piece of the Blackhawks' blue line. And the Blackhawks are not winning very many games right now, so I don't think it's too substantial of a loss. They do have a couple guys in the minors, like a Ian Mitchell or an Alec Regula, who can come in and take a third pair role for now. It's not probably ideal. I think those two would probably be better off getting more development time in the minors. But those two do have NHL experience, and I think that in the short term, calling up one or two of those guys and playing them on the third pair is not too bad of a deal for the Blackhawks. And Otenorti has more of a physical third pair defenseman and has done quite well with the Chicago Blackhawks since coming off of waivers before the season started. But losing Tenorti is not going to be ideal. He probably will only miss like a week or two, I would say. But 
Hopefully Tenority can get back into game action in the near future. Get back into the Hawks lineup and hopefully help them win some games as the Blackhawks have not been doing great as of late. And lastly here over in the Detroit Red Wings organization, they have now placed forward Tyler Bertuzzi back on injury reserve and he's going to miss the foreseeable future due to an injury. Now Bertuzzi was injured over the past few weeks and I think he's going to be out for a couple of weeks due to an inju the injury. Bertuzzi's already missed a substantial amount of the season due to injury and now he's going to miss a, another big portion. I think he's probably going to miss two, three weeks. It wouldn't surprise me if he's out until late December, early January, the earliest. But given the fact that Bertuzzi is in a contract year, he's coming off a year where he was on pace for close to 40 goals last year. He just hasn't been able to stay healthy this year. He was a big part of the Red Wings' top six. I know the Red Wings have been able to rework that top six and gotten some more guys like uh, Dominic Kubelik and uh, David Perron to fill into that top six roles. But losing Bertuzzi is once again a big blow to the Red Wings. The Red Wings are currently holding on to that last playoff spot in the Eastern Conference. So all of these players need to be healthy in order for them to have a chance to really contend for a playoff spot this year. And Bertuzzi is just not really being able to stay healthy. Bertuzzi has been able to be in and out of the lineup so far this year. He started off healthy and he missed some time due to an injury. He got back about two weeks ago, I think, and now he's back on injury reserve. So hopefully Bertuzzi can get back, not only for the Red Wings' sake, but for his. I know he really wants to prove that he can be a good offensive weapon and he's trying to work towards his new contract that he's probably going to sign in July. I don't think he's going to extend with the Red Wings. So he's going to need to get healthy as fast as he can and hopefully prove that he can still be a good offensive top six forward for the Red Wings and showcase himself so that he can get a new contract in July. Now that's all the injury updates we want to talk about. Now let's go over to the trade rumor part of the video. And I'll start off with the Vancouver Canucks. As the 32 Thoughts segment in Hockey Night in Canada, Elliot Friedman said that the Canucks have given Brock Besser's agent permission to talk with other teams about potential trade. Now this is pretty substantial news. I think that the Canucks have definitely not had the best of seasons this year. I know they've won a few games as of late. They've actually done quite well as of late, going 11-7-1 in their last 19 games after that awful seven-game start. But I still don't think they're a playoff team. If you look at the teams they would have to jump right now, the Kraken are doing good, the Knights are doing good. I know the Kings have their weaknesses, but they look like they're doing good. The Oilers are still have McDavid and Dreisaitl. In the Central, you have guys like Dallas, who we talked about earlier. Winnipeg's done quite well this year. Minnesota's done well. You also have Colorado, who's probably going to pick up the pace in the near future. And then you have guys like Calgary and St. Louis, who are on the outside looking in, but still dangerous teams. So, in my opinion, even though Vancouver's done really well as of late, they're still not a playoff team. And it may make sense for them to try and sell off some pieces and start either a retool or a rebuild of some kind. And maybe getting Besser out of Vancouver is the smartest move for them. Now, he has been a top six forward in the past few seasons, mostly playing on the top line with Pedersen. But this year, he's sort of fallen down in the lineup. I know in the past few weeks, when they've been winning some games, he has been playing on the third line with a guy like Garland and Dries. I know that they've used a guy like Hoaglander and Miller in the top six, as well as Mikheyev and Kuzmenko. So it looks like Besser's sort of being boxed out of the top six. And I can see why he's being a little bit frustrated with the organization for his usage. He also was going to be scratched on Saturday night, if not for a late injury that occurred for Dakota Joshua. And he didn't even know until he looked at the lineup sheet. So... Obviously, Besser is really, really probably hoping for a fresh start. I know there was a lot of Brock Besser trade talks last year when they were doing not so hot to start the season and then when they were getting closer to a trade line and he was a pending art restricted free agent and they didn't move him and then they signed him to a three-year $6.65 million deal in the offseason. So obviously, I don't think it's been the best of opportunities for Besser. I know that the Canucks really do need to move some cap hit out if, even if they're going to have any chance of signing Bo Horvat, I think they would need to move some cap out. And if it's Besser, it may have to be Besser. I know I still think that they should have traded JT Miller when they had a chance before they signed him to an extension. I think that the extension was probably not the best of moves that the Canucks could have made. And I still think they could have gone easily a pretty nice package for Miller if they were to trade him. But now it's going to be really difficult to move Miller's contract. And I don't really see much of any other 
player being moved. I know Myers and OEL on the blue line are not very interesting pieces to be moved right now. And Miller on the front is not going to be moved. I know Pedersen and Hughes are definitely not being moved. But really, the only two options that they I can see that could give them substantial amount of cap flexibility would be either Besser or Garland. And if it's Besser, it may have to be Besser. There were some tweets on Twitter that the Canucks could probably get a same package as what the Blue Jackets got in the offseason for Oliver Bjorkstrand. And that is a third and fourth round pick. And I'm going to say that's absolutely not going to happen. I know cap space is hard to come by and it's a very valuable asset right now. But the Canucks are not going to give Besser away for a third and fourth round pick. That's, that's crazy talk. I know that's not, not going to happen. In my opinion, the best offer would either have to be for Besser, a second round pick and a lower level prospect, or a third round pick and a more middle to high level prospect. I think that the Canucks could probably get two assets for Brock Besser, and I think that they could probably get two pretty good assets for Brock Besser if they were ending up trading him. I think that they could also take on a smaller salary if uh, to make the cap work. I think that they're not going to retain anything on Besser, but if they were to take back a contract that probably has one year left at around three, three and a half million, maybe they would do that because that contract would be able to be expired at the end of this year. And that would definitely work for the Vancouver Canucks as they would give them some cap flexibility, they could work in the off season, and maybe it would up the price that teams are willing to pay if they were able to take on a bad contract. So I don't think it is the best of possibilities for the Vancouver Canucks. If I were to say the three most likely teams, in my opinion, who could probably acquire Besser, it would have to be the Flames, the Penguins, and the Devils. The Penguins were linked to him a lot last year. I think that they could use another good winger like him. Maybe they move a guy like Kasperi Kapanen or Jason Zucker to make the cap work. Zucker's done well this year, but he only has one year left at $5.5 million. Kapanen's not done really well, and he has two years at 3.2 mil, so I think that's a little bit too long-term, but he could probably be moved in the offseason for the, by the Canucks for maybe like a, a lower-level pick. So maybe they move one of those two. Maybe they move like a round pick and maybe Pierre Olivier Joseph. When you've talked about Joseph maybe being a trade chip, and we know that the Canucks GM and president were originally from Pittsburgh and drafted Joseph, so the link there may be pretty good. I know the Canucks could have used another young defenseman, so maybe something like a Kapanen, Joseph, and a third round pick for Besser would maybe work for the Penguins. For the Devils, they've done quite well this year, and they're off to a fantastic start, and I think that this team is only going to get better as the years go on. They have a key core group with guys like Hughes and Heischer and Bratt on that team, so hopefully they can add to that core. I think getting a guy like Brock Besser would be huge. I think maybe they move off of the Andreas Janssen contract as Janssen's been a depth player playing in the AHL for majority of the season and he's making one year at 3.4 mil. So that might be okay for the Canucks to take on. Maybe a third round pick and maybe the Devils will be willing to move Shakir Mukahamiladeen in a trade. I know it's probably a little bit too much of a prospect. The Canucks may need to ask for someone who has a little bit less value than Mukahamiladeen, but if the Canucks could get him and a third round pick and Janssen for Besser, I think they would absolutely do that, getting a good young prospect and another pick. So that could be another one. And for the Flames, I know they're division rivals and it would be really difficult to make a trade. But maybe they make a trade where the Canucks, maybe if Lucic says it's okay as he does have a modified no trade cause, maybe the Canucks take on Lucic deal as Lucic is in the final year of his deal. And maybe they take on his contract. Maybe they get like a second round pick from the Flames and then maybe get a guy like Jan Kuznetsov or Jeremy Poirier. I, I could see that happening for the Calgary Flames. But I think that those three teams, in my opinion, would be the most likely to be trading for Brock Bester. And I do think that with the Canucks not doing so well and needing cap space, there is a good possibility Bester could be moved, possibly before a trail line. I could even see it possibly happening before the Christmas fr roster freeze. I know that's a little bit out there, but it, given the fact with all the news that's happened over the past few a while, I do think that could be a possibility. So Besser is a really interesting name to watch, and it's something that we're all going to have to keep our eye on very closely. But I'd like to know what you think. Do you think Besser is going to be traded? And if so, what could be the trade package, and which team do you think he could be going to? And lastly here, I want to talk about the Edmonton Oilers. Now, there's also a few reports 
late on last weekend that the Edmonton Oilers may be willing to move a first round pick to acquire Yoel Edmondson. Now Edmondson is a good second, third pair defenseman for the Montreal Canadiens and does have this year and next year on his contract at 3.5 million. So it's not a rental option. It's a year and a half, not a rental option. So the Oilers will be getting a solid defenseman for the next year and a half. Now I do think that the cap gymnastics would be really hard to work out for the Edmonton Oilers as they do have a lot of cap problems right now and are really close to the cap and Kane is going to be back at the end of the season but hopefully the Oilers can maybe work around that. The Oilers do have some cap problems so I think it would be a hard trade to make with the Oilers cap problems and I don't think Edmondson would be moved for a first round pick. I, th I could see maybe a second round pick a decent prospect and maybe Jesse Pugliarvi. I know the Canadians had been linked to Pugliarvi earlier in the offseason and had some interest in the young forward so maybe they do some sort of a move like that. I know the Canadians really do want to move some sort of a cap. I know they would probably prefer to be one of their forwards but if it was a defenseman like Edmondson they were able to get a good package. I don't think they would be against moving Edmondson so do I think that Edmondson will be moved for a first round pick to Edmonton? Probably not. I still think that the Oilers really do like that first round pick, especially in a deep draft right now. And even though their defense is not doing really hot this year, I still think that they really do need to keep that pick for a absolutely good player. And I know Edmondson has not done too well this year, only having two points in 15 games and definitely having some problems. But he's had a lot of injuries and personal issues over the past year and a half. And hopefully if he can overcome those, I still think he can be a good second pair defenseman. So do I think that Edmondson in Edmonton is not possible? No, but I don't also think that the Canadians will acquire a first round pick from Edmonton to move Edmondson. I do think a package of like a second round pick, decent level prospect in Pugliarvi will probably be more likely. And I think that while these two teams could hook up on a deal, it will probably be closer to the deadline if anything. And... I don't think a first round pick should or will go to the Canadians in an Edmonton deal. So that's all I'm going to talk about today. Remember to like this video and subscribe. I also do a blog which I will leave a link to in the description below. And I can't wait to see you guys all for the next video. See you guys soon.